Okay, that's great. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to today's meeting of the Audit and Scrutiny Committee. I'm Councillor Andrew Morrison. I'd like to just kick off with some items of housekeeping. Today's meeting is hybrid and we'll have a number of participants joining online. So I would ask for everyone to follow the usual protocols regarding that. So if you're online, please mute the microphone when you're not speaking. Use the raise your hand function if you'd like to ask a question and avoid using the chat function for debate amongst one another. A recording of today's proceedings will be made available on the Council's YouTube channel at the end of the meeting. For those attending in person, please be sure to activate your microphone when you speak and to switch off again when you finish speaking so that your contributions are picked up in the recording and that members online can hear what you have to say. Myself and officers attended will monitor proceedings with a view to ensuring all requests to speak are seen. To introduce the officers attending the committee today, we have uh, Louise Pringle, the Director of Business Operations and Partnerships, Barbara Clark, our Chief Accountant, Michelle Blair, the Council's Chief Auditor, Jill Derbyshire, the Chief Executive's Business Manager, Linda Hutchison, Clark to the committee, Leona Allison, Assistant Committee Services Officer, and both Rob Jones and Grace Scanlon from Ernst & Young, the Council's external auditors. And Kath McCormack, our <laughs> HR manager. Sorry, <laughs> Kath. <laughs> so keen to get through and get started with today's business. So, item number one on the agenda is apologies for absence. Do we have any apologies, Clark? Yes, Chief, we have apologies from Council Island. Okay, Council Island, thank you. Uh, item number two, declarations of interest. So the councillors' code of conduct requires elected members to declare any financial or non-financial interest they may have on items on today's agenda. Are there any declarations to be made? Okay, There's, that's a no. Item number three is my chairman's report. So further to comments are made in February, it's worth mentioning that just. In advance of today's meeting, members of the committee attended a training, familiarisation and development session with the external audit team, and thank you very much to you both for, for that. The session was, I would say, very useful on behalf of the, the committee. You know, we really appreciate your, your time and, and that dialogue. We covered aspects such as a uh, for guidance on the, the role of this audit and scrutiny committee, audit priorities for 2023, and some proposed legislative changes and uh, requirements for the Council's Fraud to Risk Management Framework. It's good to have such a constructive dialogue with our new external auditors and you know, get to get to really properly know you. And um, I'm sure I speak for the whole committee in saying we welcome more such sessions in the future. Okay, um, are we happy to accept my Chair's report? Thank you. Agreed, thank you. Item number four is um, a biannual report on the Council's Strategic Risk Register and Risk Management Process, and I'd like to invite Jill Derbyshire to, to speak to this item. Thank you. Thank you very much. This report provides the latest biannual update of the Council's Strategic Risk Register and a summary of risk management progress. The previous update was considered by the Audit and Scrutiny Committee on the 23rd of September 2022. The Strategic Risk Register, Appendix 1 to this report, sets out the key strategic risks to be considered by the Council and details the actions that management have put in place to manage these. Since the Strategic Risk Register was considered by the Audit and Scrutiny Committee, a thorough, risk of all, a thorough review of all risks in the Register has been undertaken, and currently five risks remain as high. Two risks were rescored from high to medium. Four risks were rescored from medium to high. Four risks were added to the register and four risks have been removed from the register. Within the report, a risk tolerance map is included and the risk distribution by outcome. In addition, a risk appetite recently approved by the Cabinet is included for information. The corporate management team continue to discuss and review the strategic risk register on a regular basis and it remains a standing item on the agenda. The Strategic Risk Register is reported every six months to the Audit and Scrutiny Committee and annually to the Council. There are currently 37 risks on the Strategic Risk Register, of which 11 are classified as high risk. 
In terms of wider risk management work, a, a revised risk management strategy and associated framework were approved by the Cabinet on the 23rd of February 2023. I'd also like to mention that eight elected members recently attended a risk management training course uh, held by Zurich, our ex external insurers, with slides being circulated to all elected members for information afterwards. The Audit and Scrutiny Committee is asked to consider and note the development of the Council's Strategic Risk Register, noting that this is considered a live document and will be updated and amended by the corporate management team as appropriate. Thank you. That's, uh, that's good, Joe. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to open now to questions and I'll kick off, if, if I may. Um, so on page 5, paragraph 12, bullet point 4, I'll, I'll give you a moment to locate that. It's a reference to um, the disconnection of the analog telephone system. Um, I was just wondering if any considerations been given to the potential impact on telecare services as a result of that. Um, so I know that you know, the, the landline operators are now specifically asking people if they were within a, a vulnerable group, which I'm, I'm sure most of our telecare users would be. Um, I was just wondering if that's been considered at all. Thank you. Take that one, Chair, if that's all right. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, telecare is one of our key priorities round about that. Um, in terms of the analogue switch off by 2025, that's been driven nationally by Ofcom um, and individual suppliers, so BT, Virgin, etc., make their own dates for that. So our priority right now is to think about the Virgin dates, which are this summer. Um, nationally, there's been a programme focusing on analogue to digital switch over for telecare um, for some time. Um, and really keenly um, monitoring all of that because of these uh, services do support our most vulnerable residents. So I'm pleased to say that our council was uh, the first council in Scotland um, in September to implement a cloud-only digital um, platform for telecare um, for our alarm receiving centre, and that's been was implemented successfully last year. So we've migrated 25% of our residents, so that's about 650 uh, clients on telecare. Um, onto their digital alarms now, and our priority for this year, because of the Virgin switch off this summer, is to get those who are on Virgin moved over as well. So we're confident that we'll be able to do that um, within those timelines, and um, there's about 100 clients within that cohort, and then thereafter we will work with the other suppliers to get everybody else moved over in time for the deadline of 2025, so um, assured that that will be taken care of. That's, that's great. Thanks, Lynn. So presumably, and perhaps the next report or the report thereafter, um, we'll see this falling from high risk perhaps to major more uh, a lower a lower risk. Um, I think it will take us a little bit of time just to understand the impact of the broader switchover um, as we work supplier by supplier. So um, there are so telecare is one issue. But there are a number of analogue lines across the council um, for things like intruder, fire alarms, lift alarms, um, building <coughs> management telemetry and other things. So the ones that are known of them are fine and we will manage them, but we expect that there might be certain things that are unknown. So when this switch off happens and we're liaising with suppliers, because it's not all within our control, there are some lines which are managed on our behalf by suppliers. So we're in contact with them as well. There is a working group in place across the council. Uh, it's been led by um, Murray Husband and his team, project manager in place. And But the risk, I think, will remain just now until we assure ourselves of, of what might happen with those unknowns, and then we can take action on them. I think that's, that's very clear. Thanks very much, Louise. I'd like to open out uh, members of the floor. Um, Brought Ms Montague. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. It was just on your point. You referred to it was a paragraph 12. And uh, it would be helpful if instead of just these uh, bullet points that are there, if the subparagraphs could be enumerated in some way, either with a 12.1 or a 12A or B, just for ease of reference and discussion. Thanks. OK, I think we've been out those comments. Does anyone have any questions on the content of the paper? Councillor Wallace. Sorry, no, uh, not not so much content. As I'd just like to thank uh, Ms. Davishire for uh, the format there, because it makes it very clear what's been scored out, what, what what's been changed, and it just makes it an awful lot easier to to read. Um, because, uh, as you know, there are a huge number of charts in here, and we see what's been changed. This makes it an awful lot easier. So, thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Bolsa. Uh, anyone else? 
at all. Okay, well, on that basis, if there are no further questions, I'll be happy to accept the, accept the report. Okay, thank you. Moving on to item five now, which is um, women's health related matters, which is a presentation from Kath McCormack, our HR manager, which has fallen a, a request um, from a committee member at a, a meeting some, some time ago. So, um, Kath, I'd like to hand over to you now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. This presentation is to provide an overview of support available for employees with a focus on women's health. It should be noted that the range of support available benefits all employees no matter what their gender is. The top three reasons for absence are the same between males and females, however the rank order does differ with the main reason for females being stressed non-work related. The absence reason can be caused by many factors including financial problems and financial well-being, caring responsibilities and relationship breakdowns. The gender split across the council is 76% of the workforce identify a female, 23.98% of employees identify it as male and 0.02% of the workforce identify it as another gender. It's understood that employees may start experiencing perimenopause or menopause between the ages of 45 and 55, and reviewing absences that might relate to this time in an employee's life, as well as period, period as well. They may be recorded or they are recorded under gynaecological absences, and the data shows that this type of absence ranks 17th out of 35 of the different types of absence reasons. Pregnancy-related absence ranks 18th out of 35. The next two slides cover the support available for staff and includes policies on areas such as menopause and domestic violence which we've either implemented or are in the process of implementing. We've pledged our support to the Miscarriage Association's Pregnancy Loss Charter, which means we consider pregnancy loss to be a bereavement. Currently, if mis miscarriage happens in the first 24 weeks, then there's no statutory right to time off. If it occurs after 24 weeks, then maternity leave applies. By pledging our support, we acknowledge that pregnancy loss is an extremely difficult time for employees and also for the partners of somebody experiencing pregnancy loss, and therefore both the employee or the partner can request bereavement leave under our council policy. Another area of focus has been working with Women's Aid to pilot some online training for staff on three areas, including gender equality, sexual violence and domestic abuse. We put ourselves forward to be part of the pilot and we will be given the final training courses to add to our existing online learning portal for staff to access through e-learning. Other areas that support health and wellbeing include a specific strategy with actions, um, sorry, actions around undertaking a staff health and wellbeing survey in April and May and we offer a range of occupational health service to employees employee assistance service that includes confidential advice and counselling, and we've also got financial wellbeing resources. The final slide just confirms the accreditations that the Council has, which includes Disability Confident, which guarantees interviews to candidates who consider themselves disabled and meet the essential criteria. Other accreditations include Carer Positive, and we've gained Living Wage Accreditation. That's the end of my presentation. I don't know if there's any questions. That's very much appreciated. Thank you, Catherine. I'd like to give first opportunity to Provost Montague to make comment or ask questions because obviously it was yourself, Provost, who requested this, this report. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I will look at it in more detail, but I thank uh, the officers uh, for, for giving us that uh, picture and uh, hearing the, the difficulties for employees in general, but for women in particular, given their uh, particular roles in society and particular health challenges. I did uh, notice one uh, part of it. It talked about perimenopause and menopause. Uh, can it be clarified? Uh, does that apply only to women? Um, it applies to people that, because there's, there's people that could potentially transition between the genders, so it could apply to both, um, to anybody, I guess, who um, is experiencing those conditions. So, 
perimenopause is the period before menopause starts, so there's a range of symptoms um, leading up to full menopause. Uh, I don't want to go into anything that's a wee bit more contentious, but my understanding is that uh, menopause only applies to biological females. So I was wondering why the two was a kind of gender neutral term that I would call a person rather than a female when other, other slides, other information is given about males and females. So it might be disputed whether pe uh, menopause does apply unless there's a male menopause that I don't know about, but uh, I, I would question that and maybe I would seek more information about why it's considered, you know, that... Anyway, I won't go any further because I feel as if I'm veering on to controversial uh, subject here. But I do welcome it, uh, but I wouldn't want, the, as is in some documents, the word woman to disappear when it's a, a definite female issue. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Provost. I think um, everyone notes, notes your comments in, in that regard. Of course, uh, this committee doesn't quite set policy there. We, we scrutinise policy. Um, so I'm sure any views that you wish to follow up on that upon the further reading you alluded to, you would have the, the channels to be able to, to do so. Um, obviously, with women forming such an important part of the East Remsor Council workforce, it really highlights the importance of the work which you're doing and the policies which we have in place for our workforce. So that's very much appreciated. Does anyone else have any questions they'd like to ask uh, Councillor Wallace? Yeah, just an interesting stat that came up there. Am I right? We're thinking that three quarters of our workforce are female and a quarter are male. Um, is it, has it always been that case? Is, is it is any changes, any concerns as far as equality is concerned, etc.? Thanks. Um, as far as I'm aware, that, that is kind of a consistent percentage. Um, I guess when you look at our workforce, we have lots of um, teaching roles, which are a lot of females in those roles. We have many caring type roles. Um, so that's generally been, it's always been around three quarters as far as I'm, I'm aware. Councillor so Wallace, come back. Yeah, I did just curious as to, is there any kind of push to try and uh, attract males to, to these particular roles? Are we trying to do anything in that? Thanks. Um, we're continually reviewing our recruitment processes and our policies and um, we, we actively look at equality um, across all genders. So, um, yeah, I mean, just for some reason, we, we do look at occupational segregation, which is where we have different genders and different roles. Um, but it's just that apparently it's a common stat across quite a lot of other local authorities as well. I think that's a, that's a very interesting point, actually, because most of don't have the data. I know from my own kind of personal network that, for example, um, our HSCP care staff, for example, I think are majority female. And there is a shortage of, of workforce there. So I don't know if perhaps um, that could be considered in any future you know, advertising campaigns, recruitment campaigns, that you know, this, is, this is a role where we, we welcome male applications too. Um, so I think that's, that's a good point. Um, Councillor Edlin. Um, I noted in the budget that, in the Council's budget that we approved a few weeks ago, uh, that we're reducing the amount of um, time that staff have um, off work. I'm struggling to use the right words, the politically correct words for sickness recovery. Um, I would like to say, I wonder if we could consider being given data to look at uh, the changes in absence patterns since we are emerging from COVID or as we are emerging from COVID and how many, the, death, the data of comparison studies of the short-term absences experienced in the Council over the last 12 months or so as we are emerging to see if that can be managed in a different way or should be managed in a different way. I doubt you probably have those figures off the top of your head, Kath, but... but I, I, I meant a future date. Presumably, um, is that something where perhaps Councillor Edelman best send an email or if that's information we can get at a future date? Um, yes, yeah, certainly as the um, annual audit and scrutiny report on sickness absence, um, so we do provide that data on an annual basis. That's right, thank you. I will withdraw the, the question there. Okay, um, anyone else? No? 
Okay, so I think we're quite happy to accept the, the, the report and thank you for, for your, your hard work, Kath. So item number six is a National External Audit Report on Tackling Child Poverty. Um, Councillor Buchanan is a councillor leading on this um, particular report and I'd now like to invite Linda Hutchison, the clerk, to the committee to set out the report. Thank you. Um, I, th I think you really covered most of what I was going to say. I mean, the Director of Mrs. Uh, Operations and Partnership is with us today, so, uh, and she's the one that's provided comments on the report, uh, which are attached. So if she's here if you want to ask for any clarification on anything. Um, yeah, um, Councillor Buchanan, would you like to say anything as the... I think just to initially begin to thank Louise for the report. I think it's uh, a very comprehensive report. And in many ways, uh, there is a, a lot of... Uh, good news in it in that our rates of child poverty we have a high number of children across the area for fairly obvious reasons uh, and it's good that we have a low rate of child poverty in the area but uh, we would rather see it I'm sure that we didn't have any child poverty and I'm sure everyone uh, would echo that ambition that it wasn't uh, something that we had but it's great to see that a huge amount of work has gone in over the years with our various programmes, whether it be Fair and East Friend, etc. We know that there has been an issue. And I suppose one of the big concerns is, despite being in a relatively good place, but uh, with a view to eradicating child poverty altogether, um, that there is a potential, uh, since this report has been done, in terms of the ongoing cost of living crisis that we're facing and that many more may well fall into that trap because of those issues, uh, particularly in relation to things like fuel poverty, which is likely to have an ongoing effect across the area. Um, and I think on that basis, clearly this report uh, could be subject to change, I suspect, uh, over the next few months as we start to see the outcome coming out of winter, uh, the outcome of the pressures that many families across the area who have perhaps never been in a position previously uh, to notice some of the difficulties that they are currently facing. And I think that's an, going to be an ongoing challenge for us. Uh, but happy to uh, hear if you have any comments or views on that. Thanks, Councillor Buchanan. Yeah, I mean, we do remain really concerned about the cost of living impact on people. Um, we are as you say, we've got very high proportions of young people in East Renfrewshire, but the lowest rate of child poverty in Scotland. But, you know, between two and 3,000 kids in poverty in East Renfrewshire is too many for us. And, you know, we would really ideally like to be doing something for each one of those. Um, and we continue to work on the data really hard to try to understand the circumstances mm -hmm. of, of those individuals and, and um, what that will mean for them. We're very much hearing from partners, um, or our own services, such as the Money, Money Advice and Rights team. I went to visit Citizens Advice Bureau this morning. We're hearing from them that you know they are seeing new cohorts of people, um, and they are the families who were just about managing before and are now no longer finding themselves in those circumstances. So um, that kind of cohort is putting pressure on charities such as Back to School Bank, for example, who you know. Families that maybe don't quite meet the criteria for free school meals or clothing grants end up at back to school bank for, for help with uniforms, etc. So one of the um, threads of work under the Child Poverty Group, which is chaired by myself and Julie Murray um, together, is about cost of the school day and how we can bring that down um, for our young people as well. So um, also we want to try and keep a, a good eye on the, the data and see that we can drill down and, as I say, understand much more about this. So I've mentioned in the paper that we're doing some work with um, the Smart Data Foundry in Edinburgh University about looking, and, and Royal Bank of Scotland, in a protected way, but to try and look at poverty rates across the area and, and look at spending habits across the area. So that's sort of showing us, um, in a really innovative way, um, new patterns which we hadn't been able to see before. And so we want to kind of drill down into those a bit further. And know Glasgow City Region are really interested in the work that we're doing there. And likewise, we are talking to Glasgow City Region about some of the data that they have access to um, about uh, child poverty rates and whether we can get any strength or cut of that data. So I'm quite hopeful we might be able to get something um, a little bit more tied down for the report. We'll bring that to Council in June um, on that, which will show us those patterns. But you're right, this is a, a, a kind of thing we need to, to keep an eye on, a close eye on, um, because I don't think we've seen the worst of it yet and our partners certainly citizens advice etc are telling us you know they're seeing 
um, new cases every week that are having an impact too. So. Thank, thank you very much, Louise. Um, if, if I could just ask, um, obviously back in October uh, 2022, um, there was 4 million, 4 .4 million um, announced for a humanitarian aid package from the LACER funding. Uh, sorry, Provost, that's uh, Local Authority COVID Economic Recovery Fund. Um, is there any feedback as to the, the outcome that that funding's had on child poverty? Is it too early to say? Or um, There will be some information about how we allocated funding. Um, we're bringing a, a second series of proposals up to Cabinet, I think, on the 11th of May is what I'm trying to aim for, um, for um, some further COVID reserve um, proposals. So, as part of that report, we will take a backward look at the proposals we brought forward in October and the difference that that has made. I've listed out some of them in the report at paragraph where are we? Um, 22. I've put in some bullet points about the types of things that that funding has enabled us to do. Um, I think in terms of the, a lot of those things are short-term measures. So we were able to, for example, augment the family bridging payments that the government was um, allowing us to do for kids that were on free school meals up until December. We've put in an additional one of those um, using that funding for March. So that money is going across the line to those families this week. They will have that in their hands by today or tomorrow. Um, so that is about 2,200 children in East Remshire. It's an updated figure from the one that's in the paper. It's about 2,200 children who will get £130 each. And that includes the £2.50 they get per day for free school meals on holidays. Um, but it's difficult for us to be able to tell what difference that does make to the families. We do know, um, in terms of lived experience work, we do know that my team was receiving calls in December from families who were just so grateful to have that funding um, given to them, help them to buy Christmas presents they wouldn't have been able to buy, help them feed their families Christmas meals, etc. So they had families in tears on the phone to them, you know, to thank them for, for that work. And so that does make a real difference um, in communities. I suppose what we are concerned about is the sustainability of some of that, because the funding that we have available to us to do those sorts of things is um, we only have one year left of COVID reserve, and we need to draw tight links between um, real COVID impacts as well as co cost of living. We need to be careful about that. So we're trying to very much work with um, local groups, local partners, um, to try and put initiatives in place to make sure that um, we get to as many families as we can, as many people as we can, and we get them on the right pathway to benefits and entitlement that will have a longer term journey um, on that. So, But you'll see some further data on that in uh, May when I bring the paper forward. Much, much appreciated. Thank you. Um, any other members like to ask a question at this stage? Um, Councillor MacDonald, online. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, I'm obviously um, very happy and confident in Councillor Buchanan taking up this role. Uh, obviously, he's got a breadth of experience in terms of his knowledge of Department of Work and Pensions, and also he he uh, is resident within Ward One, which is probably the ward out of all of our five wards that um, the, the vast majority of child poverty exists within East Renfrewshire. So he will have a personal experience there. I feel very confident in his abilities to take this forward. I think we have to be mindful of the fact that, you know, of recent we missed out on the levelling up fund. Um and, you know, I I'm I'm very frustrated about that because I feel that East Rent Fisher was given, you know, it was adjudicated based on the fact that we are as a whole affluent. Um but ultimately I feel that the way that they adjudicated that um was um not best thought out and uh, it could be a bit more targeted for the areas that actually we do have deprivation. So I kind of feel like from a national government point of view, areas like East Renfrewshire um, very often don't hit the radar as much as your more kind of defined deprived areas. So therefore, it's it's key to me anyway, and the focus is is remains on highlighting these areas that we have. I mean, ultimately, 3,000 um, is, is, as Ms Pringle says, 3,000 too many. I can only say this touches a personal nerve for me because, um, you know, I, I grew up in quite an impoverished background with a single mother in, in the 19, single unmarried mother in the 1970s in Glasgow. So I know only too well, um, you know, how difficult life can be when you don't have money to buy the basics. Um, so 
Yeah, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good report. It's come back. Um, a lot of really crucial information within it. And uh, I think going forward, we just all have to be very committed, making sure that um, the areas that need to be identified are front and centre and we get the targeted help for these people. Thank you. Anything you'd like to respond to in, in any of that, Louise? So, I, I do have a question to, to ask anyway. Um, I just didn't want to dominate the session, allow others an opportunity to, to, to ask questions too. Um, with regards to participatory budgeting, I, I know you said a lot of the measures which the Council have taken so far are really the kind of firefighting. Right, oh, it's a it's a one time benefit, um, but I know that we need to do more as a council on participatory budgeting. So I was just wondering if you envisage any kind of way of perhaps using that to build capacity within some of the communities, which can help deal with you know the causes of poverty as much as the the, the symptoms of it. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so we have a, a 1% target for um, mainstream participatory budgeting in terms of uh, trying to make sure that our, our budgets are set with um, local communities involved in those. Um, we have a way to go on that. We have we have struggled with those targets, to be honest. Um, COVID hasn't helped us in terms of capacity of services to, um, to manage that piece of work. Um, so that's a priority for us to, to get back round about that again. Um, we are looking at different ways to build capacity and skills in the organisation for that. Um, so, and I think there probably is a training need again for some of our staff uh, round about uh, who to engage with, how to engage and, and how to think about these things. So um, that's very much something that we're working on. And um, we've been having some good conversations with the new Director of Environment around those things as well. Um, she's also very keen that we do some community capacity building, which will help communities to be ready um, with projects, so should we participatory budget grant making participatory budgeting? So that's where, you know, um, we would come up, we would have a new pot of money potentially, and we want projects to be brought forward for that, and there to be a, a voting process or a bidding process. We have a way to go to build back the capacity of organisations to be ready with that stuff. Some of our organisations, the community organisations, haven't come back yet properly from COVID. So we really want to um, think this year about that COVID reserve, and you'll see some proposals coming forward around that, which will be about trying to do some good capacity building um, this year while we have that resource available to us to make sure that those organisations are ready and um, they're built back up, they have the skills, and, and they are starting to think um, what is required out there in communities. And we also will need them to be stepping into the space to provide you know, help for one another, help for their own you know, neighbourhoods and uh, as, as we face challenges. So yes, there's there's a lot of work in that space and definitely relevant in, in here. That, that sounds very welcome. Thanks very much, Louise. Uh, Councillor Wallace. Thank you. Uh, just picking up on uh, an earlier council mentioned about the levelling up fund. Um, and uh, I, I share his frustration at us, uh, us not getting these funds, particularly from us, uh, my own ward, Giffen at Thornley Bank. Thornley Bank was uh, with a tremendous project there. I think the unfortunate thing was uh, the first round, uh, East Renfrewshire Council didn't even apply uh, when the first round came round, and the second round, when it did come round, it was somewhat dilatory to, to begin with. And don't get me wrong, the, the, the final project uh, came together, but um, I just hope that, uh, that the next time this comes up, we are perhaps better prepared and uh, start to do something about the challenges that uh, Ms Pringle and her team um, are up against. OK, thanks. Okay, and um, thanks very much, Councillor Wallace. I think we'll <coughs> note your comments. So, are there any further questions, Provost? Uh, thanks very much. Yes, as, as uh, other colleagues have said, 3,000, and there might be particular concentrations of children and families uh, living uh, with poverty, but uh, it's dependent on the family's circumstances, and uh, it can be in other areas as well, even in areas where it's perceived an affluent area, there can be people struggling there too. So it is good to see the, the good work that has been done and how this has been discussed in various uh, committees and either a national level and a local level as well. And going back to the, the idea that society has judged how they, they treat the, the weakest, you know, is is something that is, uh, I feel, important to, to many of us, if not all of us. 
I'm just wondering if there's a way that we could monitor uh, this. This is a really good report and it's good to see what is being done. But uh, it's just an idea, you know, is how, how are the voices of the children affected being heard and harnessed? I know that we had a presentation from Citizens Advice Bureau and they get, gave a, a, a reflection of, of what it's like for families that, that they know of as well. And one was a mother who couldn't take her children to the shops anymore because it was difficult with the challenge of uh, children identifying things that they would want and not uh, high, high expense of things, but just basics. So uh, it is, we can understand, we can sympathise with people, but how much do we really uh, know about what it's like to be that child? And I'm just wondering if there was a way of kind of characterising uh, what it's like for a typical child who's living uh, with poverty, or is there a way that we can draw up that uh, a child in school who's living with poverty can be su can be supported by that's a list of things, and also a family living with uh, poverty can access in a list of things. So I'm just wondering if we could harness all the supports that are there and put it into some kind of uh, summarised form so that people we can give that out so that people know that they can't there is support so whatever support there is for them we make sure that we get it to children and families and it's also that physical support but how are children feeling you know that there, there might be support there for them but how do they feel you know about it and the comparison how it's like for them in a school say the school might be asking for donations of money for things. They are scraping, the family are scraping for money. Or it might be they're asked to bring in maybe a snack or something like that for something when they're struggling to provide a snack for themselves. So it's really so that we focus on and make things better for the children and families in our area. And, and I know obviously your previous occupation, Provost, this is something that you'll have first hand experience of. But I'm sure this is something which the Council does monitor. Louise, could I invite you to speak to some of that, please? Sure. Thanks, Provost. Um, that is all very, very relevant to what the discussions that we're having. So the Local Child Poverty Action Report that you will see coming to Council in uh, June will um, does have very detailed guidance that sits around it in terms of what's required in those reports and lived experience as part of that. So um, there is a duty on us to go out and collect those lived experience stories and to feed those into the report. Um, the report is already quite lengthy, so um, that's, that there's that balance to it. But um, one of the things that we talked about in the last Child Poverty Action Group was about actually how we as a group do get those stories brought to us and, and what, what should we be doing around that. Should we be creating another group where we have a bit of a board? Um, we talked about the fact that the Champions Board exists. So the Champions Board is the uh, looked after and accommodated young people, and there's a, a panel of them who have been used in the past to... Um, with a very regular relationship with the corporate management team and some elected members as well, uh, getting to know one another, doing kind of team building exercises and using their views to influence policy as well. So we're wondering about some models around about that. Um, we are I was talking to, um, when I said I was at Citizens Advice this morning, one of the things they were talking about was they uh, have been for the last year on a national pilot around um, families who go to food banks usually get you know a bag of food but there's no choice in that and one of the, the key aspects around poverty is around choice and dignity and as you say being able to go to the supermarket and choose the things for yourself so they've been on a national pilot um, just now around a uh, provision of vouchers and instead of food so people were being referred into them and being given vouchers uh, and that's been working quite well and i think they're saying that the pilot's going to continue on for another six months um, and that, and what they're finding um, working with those families is that that is giving them choice and dignity so they can take their kids to the supermarket and they are able to buy maybe the snack that the other kids have in the playground that they haven't had access to in the past because it was the choice of whatever donations had been made to a food bank. Mm -hmm. So it's things like that that are really important here and that we keep talking about that. Um, 
the, as I said earlier, the cost of the school day is a key part of what we do in the Child Poverty Action Group, and that's led by education. So they are very much taking uh, the views of parents on board um, as part of that, and also the views of, of kids in school themselves. So they will talk as part of the work around that um, about how it feels and about what the kids would be looking for at school. And um, there's quite a lot of national material as well around cost of the school day that is shared out amongst our schools. Um, it's pulled together nationally to share experiences and to share what works and what maybe hasn't worked. And that's shared out among our school establishments as well. So it's something we're continuing to work on and to get that feedback in. Um, you might be as well aware, as part of the proposals we brought forward in October, we developed a, a cost of living leaflet. And that was about all the different places that families could go to get support and get advice and, and you know, if they were struggling, get food, these sorts of things. And so we made sure that one of those leaflets went in every school bag as well and, and home to those families. Mm -hmm. um, so we had that information available to them. And we're thinking about leaflet mark too as part of the new set of proposals that we'll bring forward in May. Mm -hmm. And we might target different people. It might not be school bags. It might be um, using the data that we have to target households or, or whatever. But we're looking at that just now. So no, absolutely relevant points. I'll take them back to the Child Poverty Group. We'll continue to talk about lived experience and hopefully bring you some more of that in, in to Council in June. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, anyone have any further comments? Councillor MacDonald and Councillor Buchanan. Just one last uh, thing I wanted to mention, and that is the stigma around child poverty is usually more amplified in more affluent areas, obviously. And I'll give you a quick example. Um, a school within my ward who have a school trip planned for the end of term, um, a few days away at an outward bound centre. Uh, one of the children who is well liked and popular within the school can't attend this simply because the family can't afford it. Now, that's obviously a, a very um, you know, visible reminder to the other children of the socio-economic background of, of children that come from families that can't afford it. And it, it is much more amplified in areas where the affluence level is generally higher and those um, people that can afford to send their children to these extracurricular activities um, are, are probably higher than the national average. So when you have you know, a child that comes from a poor background, it does stick out far more in terms of being identified within the playground. I think that's also an important factor to, to, to mention. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor MacDonald. Uh, Councillor Buchanan. Um, yeah, just briefly again to thank Louise and thank everyone for the comments that have been made. And I think it's, it's recognition of a lot of the good work that has been done and what needs to continue to be done uh, to get us into a, a better position. I think one of the, the great things that we've, we've done well over the years is the, the partnership working when we work uh, particularly well with both internal and external bodies across the authority to ensure that we tackle and we get, you know, we had, we're able to address the issues not only as quickly as possible, but we get the heads up of where problems might start to arise. And the issues around things like the Champions Board, and we've seen huge success uh, with that, indeed, the First Minister, as one of our last events, was out uh, in our area looking at the work that the Champions Board had done and how successful it had been. And that in itself is fantastic. But I think it's also good that you know, we have citizens advice, we have our MAP teams, we have all our local groups working on this, whether it be through participatory budgeting in the clubs that are being run. But equally, it's key that our education uh, is involved in it, and the team there have done a fantastic job because it's even about ensuring that our relevant head teachers through PEF funding have the skills to be able to utilise all sources of funding that might help in trying to eradicate child poverty and in touching on the areas that most need to be done. So I hope that continues. I think we've done a great job in making sure that continue to bring all of that together and indeed nationally a lot of this is going back and I can confirm that discussions are taking place and will continue uh, in, including with the new cabinet secretaries and, and ministers to ensure that we take all of these things forward because it's vital that we learn from the best practice that's going on across the areas and we can obviously contribute to that but equally learn from other areas to ensure we target uh, poverty and particularly child poverty going forward and hopefully get to the situation
across the country and certainly across our area. So thanks again for continuing with that. Okay, thank you. So I think we've all had a good opportunity um, to have a, a good going through that. And uh, Louise has been very thorough in all of your answers and in your report. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'd be happy now as a committee to... It's Okay, thank you very much, Louise. Uh, so that takes us on to item seven on the agenda, which is a presentation from our external auditors. So, Rob, Grace, I'm not sure which of the two of you are going to speak to that point. Rob, um, so we'll look forward to what you might have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you said, this is our um, external audit plan for the 22-23 uh, financial statement. So this sets out our planned approach with regards to the audit of the financial statements and the uh, uh, associated wider scope and best value audit work um, in, uh, in advance of uh, approving the financial statements um, later this year. Um, we set out on the first couple of pages, page 44, I think, in the pack, um, we've set out uh, our, in our executive summary the key points, but I was proposing I'll just talk through a few uh, specific areas in the report I wanted to draw the committee's attention to, and then very, very happy to take any questions after that. Um, so I suppose starting then um, from page 49 of the pack on section two of our report, we've outlined some of the sector developments um, and some of the sector context uh, where we specifically have um, uh, taken, taken these factors into account in our, in our audit planning um, to ensure that we consider these as part of our, uh, consider appropriate responses as part of our audit work. Um, in section three of our report, we've outlined specifically our audit approach with regards to what we refer to as um, significant risks um, in the financial statements, but we've also outlined a couple of other changes or, or potential changes to our audit approach this year. Um, two areas I'd bring to the committee's attention. One on um, page 52 of the pack is around a new auditing standard, um, which is referred to as ISA 315. Um, this is around assessing risk of material misstatement, but I'm sure, as management will be aware at this stage, um, the big impact on, on, on the council that this will have is it requires auditors to do significantly more work around the audit of financial systems or systems which we could input into the financial statements. So, you know, obviously I appreciate this is our first year of appointment as auditors, so there's always going to be some changes there regardless, but this would have been a significant change in the audit approach irrespective of the change of auditors. So really just to note that and also that as part of that, uh, auditing standard, we have a specific requirement to report to those charged with governance if we identify any 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 issues, control issues, control findings. So obviously we'll report back in due course uh, to the committee should, should we identify any matters that, that are required to be reported. Uh, on page 54 of the pack, uh, we've outlined as well our audit materiality that we apply um, to the audit of the financial statements. Um, uh, so we've outlined what we refer to as our planning materiality and our performance materiality, as well as the reporting threshold. The two key numbers there really are the 3.4 million performance materiality. So that's the number around which we base most of our, our substantive audit procedures. Um, and the reporting level is actually set by Audit Scotland. So that's the level at which any errors we identify or audit misstatements we identify, we would report that back to the committee as part of our annual reporting. Um, and also, I would just draw your attention to on the right hand column, we've identified a couple of areas of our of, of our audit work where even though uh, the numbers are usually much lower than our materiality levels, we consider them material by nature um, due to the quality due to qualitative factors. So these are uh, where we apply a lower materiality anyway to our testing to, to ensure we identify any errors that may be considered material by nature. So this is around remuneration disclosures. Um, that are required to be disclosed in the financial statements and related party transactions um, which are required to be disclosed in the financial statements. From page 57 of the pack, we've outlined our response to what we refer to as significant audit risks or higher inherent audit risks. So these are essentially areas of the financial statements that we consider to have a higher risk of misstatement due to various factors. Um, the first couple of risks um, around the risk of fraud in revenue and expenditure recognition and the misstatement due to fraud and error. These are what we refer to as presumed audit risks. So essentially auditors due to auditing standards are required to assume that a risk exists um, around fraud and income and expenditure recognition unless it can be specifically rebutted. And equally, we're required to presume that management is in a unique position to be able to manipulate the financial statements should they wish to do so. So we have to design procedures specifically to address that and we've set that out on those pages. 
Um, other significant risks include the valuation of property, plant and equipment, and also the valuation of the council's arrangements with regard to P PFI liabilities and, and associated assets. That's really, again, just very much reflected of both the scale of the values that we're talking about, but also that the judgments that have to be input um, uh, often by specialists into that and the potential area um, for uh, the potential for errors in ref or, or, or misjudgments in, in that area and our requirement to respond to that. Uh, some other inherent risks we've outlined are, um, as new auditors, we have a specific requirement to consider um, the opening balance as well. So whilst not as not as detailed as our year-end audit procedures, we do perform additional procedures around the opening balances this year, and that work is well underway at this stage, as well as the valuation of the Council's share of in its involvement in local government pension and assets and liabilities, again recognising that there are a number of actuarial judgments that go into those valuations. Um, <clears throat> we've also outlined on page 64 our consideration around going concern. For the Council, that's very much thinking about the appropriateness of disclosures around going concern in the financial statements, um, uh, especially given, obviously, the, the you know, financial challenges that all, all the sector finds itself in. From page 65 of the pack, we've outlined, in addition to the financial statements audit, we're required to uh, we, we're required under the Audit Scotland Code of Practice to consider what we refer to as the wider scope audit dimensions around financial management, financial sustainability, vision leadership and governance, and the use of resources to improve outcomes. And all of that, along with other work, factors into our overall assessment of the Council's arrangements to secure best value. Um, we've outlined that in more detail from page 66, and I suppose the three or four areas I would just draw attention to are Audit Scotland sets every year specific areas of audit focus um, around best value, and this year that's outlined on the bottom of page 66, um, uh, in particular this year around the clarity of the Council's vision and priorities um, uh, and how community review views have been reflected among other areas. Um, so we'll be undertaking that work in the next couple of months. Um, and then uh, we also have, within financial sustainability uh, aspect of our wider scope work, we've identified what we refer to as a wider scope or area of audit focus, which is probably unsurprisingly for, for committee members around obviously the financial challenges going forward that the council is expected to face um, and its requirement to continue to set balanced budgets going forward and meet its statutory obligations. <coughs> And then finally, we've also been requested by Audit Scotland to pick up additional work, um, uh, which we've outlined in terms of our vision, leadership and governance work around the Council's consideration of potential, <coughs> sorry, potential cyber security risks. Uh, and then finally, um, on page 71 of the pack, we've outlined um, within the report a number of appendices. This really just fulfills our, our, our requirements for reporting and communicating to those charged with governance. Um, that's all I was planning to say, so very happy to take any questions or comments. Yeah, um, I'll kick off with a couple of questions, if that's OK. Sure. Um, the first one relates to um, ISA 315, the International Standard on Auditing. It, what's the, the kind of like practical implications of that? Because, uh, as I understand, at the beginning of a new engagement, you would generally test systems to a greater extent anyway because you don't have any acquired understanding of them. Uh, no, you, no, you're absolutely right. I think the um, the I think there would be a greater level of analysis or, or investigation in year one anyway. But <clears throat> specifically, regard with regards to ISA three one five, it is extending an auditor's responsibilities into not just, for example, the council's financial system. So, for example, its financial ledger, but any systems which could ultimately impact that. So, if I think about you know, in any given example, we will often walk through the sort of key processes and systems and controls that are in place and maybe do some testing depending on our audit approach. Um, what ISA 315 really does um, in, in terms of those specifics is it requires us to, to get a much greater understanding, a much greater level of understanding of the system controls that are in place. Um, <clears throat> which is particularly different where I think in most cases now we're all very very, it's very usual for auditors to take what we'd refer to as a substantive audit approach, where we substantively test a lot of the information, as opposed to relying on not just the, the overall controls, but the actual underlying system controls, which can be much more challenging. So that tends to, that's tended to maybe not happen as much in recent years, whereas ISA 315 is essentially making that a specific requirement again. I, but again, I would say that that's the... Um, 
that's the area the council will see the difference. I, it's, it's not to say ISA 315 isn't much more pervasive, uh, you know, it's a, essentially a, a change in our overall you know, risk of material misstatement assessment procedures as well. That's, that's great, thank you. And the, the second question for opening up to the floor is uh, the valuation of property plant equipment has been identified as an uh, you know, important risk area. And on page 59 of the aggregated paper, so it's page 19 of the EY report, um, on the right hand side, it's the fourth bullet point down. Um, so, in response to that risk, uh, you'll assess any changes to the useful economic lives of assets. Um, you'll, you'll be aware of the, the impact of the get to net zero targets, which local authorities face. Um, could that potentially shorten the useful economic lifespan of some of our assets, for example, um, refuse collection trucks, and will that be considered in, in your work? Yes, so that, that that's that's a perfectly good example of where that could occur. So, um, the changes to change it, or the risks that we consider around the potential for change to useful lives is that obviously assets are depreciated over the, the course of their life. But if that life is set incorrectly, then they're essentially they're not being depreciated quickly enough quite often. Um, and and the one of the key risks is essentially that with you know climate being climate targets being an example, assets have actually become obsolete over a period of time. So our, our testing will will consider that again on a sort of uh, a materiality, you know, a, a material basis. Probably a, a much, you know, an, another much larger example in terms of scale would be, you know, it's a, a very generic example. But if an organisation, you know, change, you know, changes something to the point where the location of a building is no longer relevant or is being underutilised at that point because it's it's just no longer fit for purpose, which can frankly may be the case in terms of in terms of climate considerations um you know we would then we would then consider whether or not the depreciation should be you know the depreciation rates should be revised or an asset should be essentially impaired um it, you know, impaired down during the financial year when it's identified okay that's that's very helpful thanks so much rob any other members with any questions barbara I just really wanted to give you some more information about, about your question. The uh, Director of Environment, I understand, is going to be putting a policy document to Cabinet before the recess uh, on moving fleet to get to zero. Um, we also, within the capital programme for our heavy fleet, we've got a rolling five-year programme. So um, I would think that the, the replacement to electric vehicles will dovetail in with that programme. Okay, that's that's great. So it sounds like what's been audited will be kind of there or thereabouts. Already. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you, uh, Councillor Wallace. Completely unrelated, but just to just to throw this wee pebble in the water. I appreciate all this net zero stuff that's going on. Uh, great concerns about this lithium mining and all the rest of it that's going on just now. But this may be one for um, for further discussion out with this uh, arena. But um, this rush for net zero, I think we maybe want to have a closer look at. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor. And uh, Councillor Edlin. Could I ask a question relating to Appendix E, please? Yes, absolutely. Um, as this is the first time you've just been appointed as auditor, could you, as often constituents ask questions about the matter I'm going to raise, can you, can you specifically advise me uh, I think, were you appointed by a competitive tender or by a, an in, in, uh, interview process? I can't remember. I may have been told before, but I've forgotten. And I don't have the papers going back on that. And can you explain how the fee is reached? What are pooled costs and, uh, and audit support costs? I think audit support costs are presumably other person, <coughs> um, uh, other work associated with the audit, etc. So, could you give us some more detail about this, please? This, this is the first year of your appointment, please. Yep, no, absolutely. Um, so, you, you're correct. Um, audit Scotland, the, the bodies that audit Scotland are fundamentally responsible for, are um, uh, subject to a sort of, uh, well, it, it's usually a five year appointment process. Um, last year, or, or for the last appointment process, it was actually extended to six years because otherwise the retender would have come during the sort of the height of the COVID pandemic. So um, it was extended for one year. Um, so essentially, every five years, there is a competitive tender process where <coughs> uh, where external firms, in order to essentially top up the uh, the, re the resource requirements for audit um, across across Scotland, 
are uh, invited to invited to tender bids, and there are various considerations there, um, including obviously the fees quoted, but also you know, various land quality and compliance considerations to ensure that we're um, we're essentially you know, in a in a in a position to be capable to undertake the work. Um, so in terms of our, our understanding of, of key issues and experience, and and also our, our capacity to undertake the work. So that tender process happened at the end of 2021. Um, and then, and then appointments uh, after, uh, yeah, and included a, an interview arrangement with Audit Scotland and the Accounts Commission. After that, the appointment period uh, under, you know, was went th we went through the appointment period in 2022, and then obviously the council would have been made aware at some point during 2022 that there was a change. Um, so broadly speaking, in terms of context, you, you know, or, or for, for the committee's context, around two thirds of the bodies that are subject to Audit Scotland appointment are audited by Audit Scotland, and then about one third are appointed to other firms um, to ensure that there's sufficient capacity in the system. So do, do you, I'll, I can talk can I ask a supplementary, things. please? Can you explain the the principal fee of two hundred eighteen thousand eight hundred and thirty? How many man hours that represents, and our billing time is appropriate for that, please? Uh, yeah. uh, that we should just so we know how much time is involved in this work, basically, and how many staff are involved in it. Sure. Um, so, so to answer, well, I'll, I'll come to that in a second. But to answer your other question about fees, the way the fees are broken down, the uh, the audited, uh, as you've said, the auditor remuneration, the expected fee, um, it, that that's the remuneration that, that Ernst Young receive as part of the audit. The other areas in terms of poor costs, audit support, audit support costs, those are costs that go towards audit Scotland in terms of their other responsibilities. So I appreciate it's been slightly or a slightly new situation for the council because obviously you've. You would have interacted with Audit Scotland as your auditors in the past, but then Audit Scotland also have responsibilities as you know the overall, you know, or, you know, you know the Auditor General and their overall responsibility for managing the audit arrangements around Scotland and the other, uh, around Scotland and the other work they do there. So that's just how that is split out. Um, in terms of the uh, the auditor remuneration, I don't have the exact figures to hand, um, but I think our approximate estimate for this year is that we would imagine. Uh, I think we, we, we expect the audit to, to take approximately two and a half thousand man hours. Um, that's split across, uh, obviously, myself and Grace. Um, and then there's a there's a team of about half a dozen individuals um, who will make up the core the core audit um, individuals um, below that. Um, and then, as necessary, as we've referred to in terms of our risk, we also then have uh, a range of specialists that we'll call upon. So, for example, in terms of the valuation of of assets, we, we have our own valuation, internal valuation experts who will be used to to assess the the audit reports, and we'll also um, have the uh, and we we'll also have our, our actuarial specialists to consider things like the actuarial assumptions within the uh, within the uh, the council's IS19 reports for for its valuation of pension assets and liabilities. Quite happy then, Councillor yeah. Redland. Uh, questions? Uh, uh, yes, thank anything you. else or no? Okay, um, promised. I'll keep this brief. I'm assuming when you're saying man hours, you include females as well. So could we please use the term staff hours, especially when you've got a very highly qualified and competent woman sitting beside you? So steam, steam coming out my ears, so I'll just stop there. Thanks. Absolutely. Apologies. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Don't need to look any further than the council's own internal accounting team. That you know, obviously, the uh, to, to to see that. But yeah, um, I think I think we kind of know what, what what was what was meant by the use of the expression. Uh, do I have any questions in terms of the the report? No. So we're quite happy to accept that. So thank you very much. Uh, that brings us on to final item on the agenda, which is a review of the internal audit strategic plan for the years 23-24 to 27-28. And we've been asked to uh, accept this report, but before that I'd like to invite Michelle to speak to it and take any questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, in preparing the plan, the starting point is obviously the audit universe, where we try to identify all potential audit issues. Um, this is done using a variety of sources. We, we look at past audits, we discuss any potential future areas with directors, heads of service, other key officers, external audit, elected members. We look at the, the strategic risk register. 
Um, and the other purpose of the audit universe is to help determine what the audit needs are compared to the days that we have available. Um, as in previous years, we aim to audit all areas within at least every five years, but it will de be determined by the risk. Um, I've tried as much as possible to accommodate audits that we deferred in the last year, 22-23, to be included in this year's plan, specifically IT asset management, energy and fuel, and early learning and childcare payments. The other, ones that, the other items that were deferred were grant certification, contract and school cluster. We, we do tend to have school clusters audits every year, um, and there is one included in 23-24, not be the one that we deferred last year. Grant certification is very much determined by whether we receive any grants to certify, and we didn't receive any in 22-23, so there wasn't a huge issue deferring that. Um, when I compare the audit needs, which you've got at paragraph 16, page 87, compared to um, the estimated audit resources available, over the five years there's an estimated um, 40 days shortage. Now, the estimated days are based on a number of assumptions, so we have to estimate how many days we'll have sickness absence, um, training, how much we'll need to use for contingency. So it is very much judgmental and it, it can change, but it, a close eye is kept on it throughout the year. Um, at the time of preparing the plan, um, I had two vacancies and I have made the assumption that these two posts will be filled in by the end of the first quarter of the year when calculating the number of days available, but I'll obviously keep audit committee members um, appraised of where I am with that during the year. Um, on the basis of consultation and known changes, obviously I, I have changed what's in the audit universe. So for example, some of the items I've taken out of the audit universe or look as if they've disappeared, such as pupil equity fund and VAT free purchases, I've now incorporated them and in, I will incorporate them into the plan for the school cluster audit. So they haven't disappeared, but they'll just be covered more cyclically. Um, the only one I've really kind of deleted completely is Clyde Valley Contract Group. Um, we did that audit um, during 22-23 and there were no key um, control issues. So as a one-off, I, I don't really see the need to, to look at it again, um, but I'll review it each year. Um, the only other thing I would draw to your attention is that there are some items in the annual plan which won't result in a report being issued to management, and that is climate change and grant certification generally. It usually results in a, in a letter to the awarding body. Um, there's also days set aside for the trust, ERCLT trust, and the ERC IJB. Um, the reports will be directed di directly to these two bodies as opposed to the council. Uh, total contingency time, I've set it at 100 days because, again, it's a difficult area to estimate um, and it's used for dealing with numerous queries that we get. To give you a kind of example, in 22-23, I think we've used probably about 50 days contingency, but some years it's been higher, some years it's been lower. So, in summary, the annual plan is page 91 and, as, as previous, I will report progress against this to the Audit Committee quarterly. So, subject to any questions, I would ask you to approve the plan. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, I'll kick off with a, a question, if I can, which is on page 94. Um, I thought actually just penny just dropped with me there that under the the city deal um, audits within the the audit universe, we've got 15 days per year for the the coming five years. Um, will, will that kind of be a, a realistic expectation of how the work will accrue? Because obviously, cabinet recently approved. Um, you know, the progression of some of the city deal projects, so there may be more work within the next year or two, but less in years three, four and five. I was just wondering if you would be able to accommodate that if if needs be. Um, the, the days in for city deal, um, there's this partly an expectation from Glasgow City Council as a lead authority um, that we do spend some time every year on city deal. We've obviously got contingency if we did need to spend more time, but generally 15 days is usually about enough to, to look at the, the returns that the Council prepare and submit to Glasgow. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much. Um, any other member with any questions at all? Uh, Councillor Wallace. Yeah, 
can you explain what uh, grant conditions? What, what's what, what's that? It, it's, it's on the list there. Oh, sorry, grant certification. I beg your pardon. I said condition. Grant certification. What, what does that refer to? Thanks. Um, there's there's sometimes a requirement for internal audit to certify um, amounts paid out by grant awarding bodies, and typically in the past it's been Strathclyde Passenger Transport, where we pay out, we receive large amounts of funding from SPT, and they require internal audit to certify the, the amounts that have been paid. Um, but there's no specific time scale as to, as to do it. We have to wait until we've claimed the money and I've received the certificates to certify. Uh, I'm conscious that uh, your department has been under uh, a huge amount of pressure with, with, with staffing, etc. And I, I know, ironically, there was a, a good number that were pulled away in order to get involved in uh, the allocation of grants for COVID and for, for businesses, etc. And I seem to recall this came up in conversation in which uh, the question was asked as to whether these allocations and, uh, and, and the manner in which businesses were applying for these grants as to whether these, uh, the detail that was um, given by these businesses was, was correct and, and accurate and that we were giving out these uh, very uh, large sums of monies uh, to businesses. Um, I think the concern at the time was um, were they le legitimate um, applications and whether or not uh, any time has been spent on to trying to uh, get to the bottom of that. Thanks. We did do an audit on COVID grants. I think I can't remember. I think it was 21, 22. In terms of the amounts paid out under COVID grants, it was very much the case that the, the department that was leading in this was environment and they were following the government guidance and that was all we could check that they were complying with the government guidance in terms of what verification was provided by the applicants. I've asked this question before, I'll ask it again. Um, did internal audit and indeed any of, of, our, um, of our accounts people feel that uh, the direction that was given uh, by central government was sufficient to ensure that um, there was correct scrutiny or sufficient scrutiny in these applications? Thanks. Okay, Michelle. I don't know if I'm qualified to comment on that. Um, I think the other thing we have to bear in mind is that it was all done at very short notice. So there was a lot of scrabbling about trying to get systems and, and forms in place. So I, I, don't, I don't think I could really comment on, on that. But just to say finally, on it, I, th I think that was the problem in that we do under, uh, understand the pressure that individuals were under in order to get these uh, grants out and the monies out as quickly as possible to ensure that the businesses um, had some degree of continuity. It was just a concern. I, I don't know, per perhaps um, external audit might have something to say about this with, with their own experiences. Um, it's just you, we hear so many scare stories about money has gone out uh, fraudulently um, applied for. And, uh, you know, when we start hearing about all the child poverty and everything that we're faced with, and there's individuals out there who have been taking money. Um, uh, so I, I, I do recall um, there was a, a previous meeting uh, where we considered an audit Scotland paper, um, Scotland's response to COVID-19. And I can't remember the name of the officer we had here, but they did kind of come down and we had a, a going through in terms of the grant application process and scrutiny process, Clark. I can't remember who came, but I think that we did get some information, so I'm happy to see if I can find that and circulate that um, after the meeting. I, yeah. I, I can't remember the exact details of it, but come back to you on that. Yeah, I, I do remember, I think it's someone from the Environment Department, uh, because we, we had that kind of going over on, on that. Um, any further questions at all? No? On that basis, are we happy to accept the recommendation that we... Um, approve the internal audit plan for the coming five years? Agreed. Great, okay. Thank you with that. And uh, with that, that brings us to the close of today's business. Thank you very much for your attendance. <laughs>